Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, DevOps, a new paradigm for security operations. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of this webcast today. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And also feel free to submit comments via this widget as well. We really appreciate your feedback. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand version of the webcast and the slide deck. So now, let's get on with the presentation. Our first presenter today is Scott Crawford. Scott is Research Director of the Information Security Practice at 451 Research, where he leads coverage of emerging trends, innovation, and disruption in the information security market. And there's more on Scott in the bio widget um, and his photo there um, and some contact information. Our second speaker today is David Meltzer. David is Chief Technology Officer at Tripwire, where he is responsible for working with customers, partners, and industry experts to imagine, innovate, and deliver on advancing the state of the art in protecting Tripwire's customers from the most sophisticated attackers in the world. There's more on David as well in the bio widget. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Scott Crawford of 451 Research. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Kate, and thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're really glad to have you here to discuss the topic, which is a great deal of interest across a number of uh, camps in IT and across the business, and that's this concept that has come to be referred to as DevOps, which is actually the fruition and the convergence of a number of trends, really kind of focused around agility, agility and efficiency in packaging and delivering software and application functionality, delivering uh, agility and, and efficiency in delivering IT itself, and in serving the business by getting functionality to market more quickly, more effectively, and more responsibly to serve business needs uh, more effectively and make IT a uh, more positive contributor to the business. It's a trend that is built on a lot of that has gone before it, and not least of that has been the advantages gained in IT from the technologies of virtualization. And one of the advantages of virtualization is that it takes a lot of what had heretofore been a physical implementation of technology, software, and hardware, and turned it into software pretty much top to bottom and delivering infrastructure effectively as code. And one of the key things that that entails is that that means that the entire stack, physical through software, through applications, becomes programmable. And yes, of course, a purist might take issue with uh, the assertion that hardware becomes programmable. But the fact is, even in terms of infrastructure architectures, we now have the concept of software defined almost everything in the data center and the network. Uh, to the extent that functionality that had heretofore been only directly programmable in physical systems are now programmable via software and via APIs. And the delivery of technology in the way that it's packaged and made a lot more portable across platforms and environments also helps to serve these primary interests. For this reason, we also find that automation has become central to DevOps values, uh, in part enabled because of the programmability of infrastructure, but also because weaving together of these technologies in a more coherent and agile whole demands their responsiveness to the capabilities of automation that will help ease these processes and further speed the development of technology to market. But it's not just about technology. DevOps is also about breaking down silos of culture and practice as well, too. And when we talk about speeding technology to market and making that process more efficient, we're talking about the way people work as much as anything else. And for security professionals, 
This introduces a new opportunity to work more directly with both development and operations teams in terms of defining, implementing, and assuring security throughout the life cycle from concept into production operations. Now, that's a good thing, but it also comes with some challenges of its own. And we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail, but there are going to be very few organizations, and in fact, few today that are affected to some degree by these trends. In terms of infrastructure definition and delivery, particularly in the data center, we've all been affected to some extent by the advent of, of cloud and by the technologies that, are, that revolve around DevOps. It's something that will continue to affect all of us more and more as time goes by. So we're going to take a look today at this mostly from the pragmatic and operational perspective and the impact uh, more on operations than in other aspects of, uh, of IT or security. And when we do, we're going to see that some things still remain true about security. We're still concerned with reducing the attack surface and reducing the opportunity for the adversary uh, across environments, across tools, and across practices. And that means we're still going to be concerned with defining a secure configuration for these environments and defining secure operations for deploying, uh, running, and managing these environments, which means we're also going to still be concerned with, that, uh, concerned with assessing their security and validating that assessment over time as these environments remain in operation and as they change over time. What's different, I mean, the first thing that's most obvious to most organizations is that the nature of the stack, if you will, has changed a lot just in the last few years. And again, we'll talk about that in some more detail here shortly, but one of the central factors for operational deployment in particular today is the focus on containers and, t and container technology, which uh, inherits some from virtualization, but is different from traditional approaches to, say, virtual machines, for example. The tools used to define and deploy these environments are also new to a lot of organizations, and each organization may have its own preferences in the, in the tools they adopt and in the way that they use them. The processes for defining the conception and delivery of IT from application development all the way through operations may also be somewhat new to security professionals. And one of the things that really brings up is, again, getting back to this notion of programmable infrastructure. Security professionals are going to have to be a lot more literate in the tools and the programming techniques used to define security in these environments than they may have been in the past. And that's something that security pros generally are going to focus on a lot more going forward. And lastly, one of the key security advantages to uh, these concepts in, in these environments is the notion of immutability. We'll talk about that as well in some more detail, but in a nutshell, what that means is the ability to define something that goes into operations and remains largely unchanged. If you discover an issue that needs to be fixed or remediated in the environment, whether it's performance, application functionality, or in our case, security, you're not inclined to remediate the running environment in operations. Rather, you can change the image of that environment that's configured and then deployed in operations and gradually supplant what runs in operations over time. And that gives us a lot of advantages, particularly in terms of performance and availability. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail here shortly. But to start with, let's take a look at one of the fundamental technological underpinnings uh, that has made DevOps a reality today, and that's this concept of containers. It's a different paradigm from what we've uh, become used to along the lines of the virtual machine paradigm over the last decade or so, in that a virtual machine effectively replicates the entire underlying host operating system environment in, in many cases. And on that environment, you can run whatever applications, resources you want to within that host that's effectively an image of it is cloned, if you will, and that's actually what's served up as the runtime. With containers, we're taking advantage of a lot of the more recent and more sophisticated isolation and segmentation abilities that in many cases are built into the underlying host operating system. But the packaging of those availabilities and the ability to make them portable across environments is something that has been brought together in technologies such as Docker, for example. And what can be done in this case is that an entire application, or let's call it a software unit, because when we talk about applications in this paradigm, we may mean something very different than we've met in, meant in terms of applications in the past. But let's say a bundle of functionality, one unit of software that has functional operational capability is packaged in a container with all the dependencies that it needs 
and with the ability to be portable to any underlying environment that supports that containerized uh, concept, that containerized operating functionality, any other Docker engine that's compatible with that, with that container packaging. So top to bottom, you can package an application, all its dependencies in terms of binaries, libraries. You can even define a certain amount of network segmentation at that level, uh, process and memory isolation for the underlying platform. A very neat and efficient way to deliver functionality across platforms and a real boon to developers, for example, because they can package all the dependencies, anything needed to run an environment that can then be deployed as a package on any other environment. So it makes more efficient use of the underlying physical resources and makes it more efficient to package and deliver applications into operations. And for security, it has some distinct advantages as well too. When you're deploying an entire virtual machine, you may be deploying all the vulnerabilities, all the services that come bundled with that underlying environment. With a container, you strip down that environment to only what's needed for just that container, which reduces the attack surface and reduces uh, the potential to expose vulnerabilities that are not relevant to the functionality you're trying to put into production operations. But there are some gotchas with the way that you can define and deploy containers in these operational environments, which we'll talk about here more in just a moment. So how is, are these deployments put together to build applications and functionality today? And this is what's different in many respects about the nature of applications we see emerging now. A container can contain, sorry for the redundancy there, but a container can contain a completely self-contained application. Like if you want to put up a, a, a WordPress instance, for example, you can bundle the whole thing in a container, serve it up on a container platform, have it run entirely uh, self-sufficiently, self-contained, the entire application in that environment. Or you can deploy a container that delivers just one very modularized uh, piece of functionality, if you will. Those functionalities can then be put together in a larger application, a more composite application, if you will, that's made up of those individual functionalities to which we've largely applied the label of microservices over the last few years. And this is a different approach to application integration than we've seen in the past. Um, it's not entirely new. I mean, we have seen applications woven together in the integration of APIs. We have seen applications where that's visible at, uh, at the level of the user when you drop in, say, an app, a map widget into an application to show the location of someplace that's being referred to uh, in a web application, application, for example. With microservices, you can do that and much more. You can call out two uh, APIs to integrate functionality in a more complex application. And that, has, that introduces a paradigm for developers in particular that may veer more away from development and more towards application engineering by building applications from microservices and building broader functionality from these microservices in ways that make the deployment of IT much more modular than in the past. We're going to take a look at three key focused areas uh, with respect to operations and security in DevOps, beginning first with the definition of the operational environment, the deployment of that environment, and some operational considerations for security that you need to keep in mind in the ongoing maintenance and running of that environment. So first of all, let's take a look at defining the environment and preparing it. There are some existing standards and benchmarks that organizations can refer to in constructing the environment in a secure way from the outset. And these cover everything from the underlying platform, the underlying cloud platform, if you're serving up your environment on a hyperscale platform, uh, a major cloud service provider, um, Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, just to name three, there are uh, guides to configuring the underlying environment to make it best prepared from a security perspective to support your uh, uh, functioning operations in uh, your deployment in operations. NIST also provides a number of these guides and they provide them again at every level from the underlying platform to the underlying container environment, the container runtime itself, container images, build files, host configuration, and this is a lot of good information that you can make use of from the outset, but that begs the question of exactly how do you make use of these guides? And again, getting into that in a little bit more detail here shortly, but this guidance is available, and it can be packaged in such a way to make the definition of your environment itself more efficient. 
at multiple levels of deployment. Let's talk about one of them in particular, because again, this kind of harkens back to one of the newer aspects of technology for a DevOps environment, and that's containers. You can define a configuration for containers that you're going to use by building uh, a, a container and storing it in a container registry. And in fact, there are a number of publicly available registries from which you can obtain existing container images already. And one of the advantages there is that not only can you rely on a pre-built image that has already been vetted for a number of capabilities and configuration requirements, but you can build on top of them as well, too. So let's say that you had a standard container image that you wanted to add uh, authentication to. You wanted to build in OAuth functionality. You could do that, and then you could register that as an image that you use yourself as a reference image for building further capability on that image as well, too. Um, this means, however, that to go the, the extra mile in terms of assurance of the environment that you're building and deploying, you may want to consider building your own private registries as well, too, and verifying those. Uh, verifying the images that you source to build into those registries uh, by relying on implementations such as Docker Content Trust, for example, but also verifying your own repository of images that you have vetted, you have evaluated, and that you feel confident in using as your reference images for what you build and deploy. <clears throat> and again, this is where you can apply those specifications that we talked about in the previous slide and make sure that your images conform to your standards for what you consider important in your environment. You also want to assure you know, proper access to these registries. You want to assure communication security for exchanging images and communicating with registries and between registries and the build, uh, development, and operational environments. So you're gonna to wanna to use standard techniques like TLS or SSL for image movement, uh, assurance of command and control functionality, and so on. So some of these are you know, security basics we're already pretty familiar with, but you want to make sure you implement it at the level of controlling the definition of your environment before you actually put it into production. <clears throat> One of the big differences in DevOps from a lot of approaches that have characterized IT up to this point is the tool set that's used to define processes and automate those processes all the way from development through to operations. We're going to focus primarily here on the tools for building, deploying, and operating these environments. Um, we're not going to focus so much on the development aspect, although I will say that DevOps does give an opportunity for security to work a lot more closely with developers for defining secure functionality from the outset. But when it comes to tools for uh, creating a build, there are a number of tools for that, checking in software and managing software repositories through Git and GitHub, uh, some of the more uh, popular build tools uh, we see uh, over to the left-hand side of the spectrum, like uh, Team City, Circle CI, for example. Uh, I've categorized some of the build and deployment tools kind of crossing a spectrum, like Jenkins, for example. But as we go farther to the right, you see we see some of the tools like for container deployment and orchestration, Kubernetes, for example, in terms of defining the operational environment, Chef and Puppet. Uh, which really expands the capabilities of scripting that can be very broadly generalized across the underlying IT and infrastructure environment. And then, of course, uh, the cloud platforms themselves, uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and even, you know, if you're going to build your own or your own private cloud or your private cloud to a certain a specific specification, then you can refer to uh, frameworks like OpenStack, for example. Now, it's really easy to think of these tool sets as being confined to one particular area of DevOps, such as this is a tool that's really only about building, but you're not going to use it to deploy and operate your environment. Um, or you're not going to use it to push uh, your build out to the production environment to orchestrate it and assure availability and performance in that environment. But that isn't always entirely true. And in fact, we've seen a case of this in some of the earliest demonstrations uh, proofs of concept in ways that uh, DevOps pipelines and continuous implementation, continuous deployment tools can be exploited uh, to take advantage of gaps in the security of processes that define DevOps in ways that the tools and the tool sets themselves can be exploited. So we saw a demonstration of this at, at DEF CON last summer where uh, the credentials used to access the uh, production environment 
in this case, uh, Microsoft Azure, were stored in an instance of uh, GitHub that once the build was accomplished in GitHub, it could be pushed directly to the cloud environment uh, via webhooks in the build and via credentials that were stored in the uh, build environment to access the cloud platform directly. So this is a case where you don't want, first of all, you don't want to see the tools themselves as being so siloed and isolated to one particular function that they can't overlap into other functions. A build tool can push the environment out into production. As a security professional, you're going to want to get familiar with these tools and understand where you're going to want to define limits on what those tools can do for the sake of security itself. Uh, you don't want to interfere with the agility of processes and operations, but you do want to inject some sanity into the way that they are used. You may want to be a little bit careful about storing access credentials within those tools, which can expose your production environment, your cloud environment, directly to exploit if uh, the tools part of the tool chain themselves can be exploited. So you want to take concepts of separation of duties that we're most familiar with in terms of defining human segmentation, if you will, and apply those to the tool sets and define some sane boundaries for what the tools can and cannot do to protect your organization against the exploit of the processes beyond what can be exploited in the underlying uh, environment itself. Now, when it comes to that operational environment, there are a number of tools that can orchestrate the deployment of functionality into operations the way that uh, the operational environment is defined and the availability and performance of the environment by virtue of how the operational environment is deployed across, uh, across the runtime. And there's a number of these. And again, these tools function at multiple levels. So at a fairly low level or broad level, if you want to look at it that way, there are tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Fault, for example, that can very broadly be used uh, for scripting and automation to define everything from the underlying infrastructure uh, to the container environment itself. There are tools that are specifically purposed to container orchestration, like Kubernetes, Mesosphere, for example. Um, you can use these tools in combination in a variety of ways, and again, one of the things that a secure, as a security professional you're going to want to get familiar with is how your organization uses tools, what tools they use, and their preferences in choosing and using these tools and tool sets. And it would behoove you also to get familiar with the advantages of each of those tools for defining and implementing security in the operational environment. The Kubernetes, for example, allows you to define uh, the node selector parameter, allows you to assign a role certain uh, families, if you will, of containers that can adhere to a certain policy. So that makes it possible for you to segment uh, network and access, access to uh, data functionality that's appropriate to one level of sensitivity, let's say a website or website functionality that's exposed broadly to the consumer environment versus that which handles sensitive personal information from your customers, for example, or something that should only be inward facing to your enterprise, like functionality only accessible by your employees, uh, uh, for a further example. Um, everybody probably has some sensitivity to exposing uh, functionality to third parties after the target breach. That's another area where you can use things like uh, policy definition in these environments to segment that functionality. But make yourself aware of how these tools can be used to assure security uh, priorities in the operating environment. You can also use them to integrate your ability to check for and define security in these environments. And again, some of them are quite flexible. So get familiar with them, get hands-on with them as much as you can, particularly the ones, obviously, that are most relevant to your organization, and find out what they do and what they can support in order to define this so that you become as literate as the teams that you're working with as you help break down these silos of practice and culture across development and operations teams. Touching on a couple of operational principles before we move on here. Again, coming back to this concept of immutability, it really is one of the most valuable aspects of security in DevOps environments. And because you can define an image and then put it into production means that once you find a security issue or become aware of a security issue in the production environment, you can remediate it by defining the image without affecting the performance and availability of operations. And once you put that image, have tested that image and put it into uh, operation, it can be deployed on demand and either gradually or quickly supplant the existing images that you have running 
assuring uptime and availability while still dealing with security issues at the same time. So you're going to have to deal a lot less with having to manage repair in production. And one of the big advantages for security teams is that means a lot fewer calls at 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. I mean, everybody, every security professional who's ever had to deal with remediation in production knows that you don't get a whole lot of sleep on Saturday nights <laughs> if you have to deal with these things in production. But the immutability of these environments makes that a lot more amenable not affecting real-time operations when you have to deal with them. Um, it also means that incremental changes can be made very frequently to the operational environment without effect on performance or availability. But this becomes an issue for security teams because, again, this gets back to the agility factor that really drove a lot of DevOps in the first place. So we have to be as agile as the teams that we're working with. When we respond to security events or security issues, we have to work them into the workflows of production and development and be as responsive as they are. So even though we don't have to get up at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning to deal with these issues in production, we still have to be aware that we're going to be expected to be as agile as the development and operations teams that we're partnering with. And that, for one thing, means that you're not going to want to just validate an image once before you put it into production. You're also going to want to keep an eye on the real-time operational environment for a couple of reasons. For one thing, new issues can emerge all the time. New vulnerabilities, new exploits, new configuration challenges and issues can come up all the time. And you'll want to be monitoring your operational environment to see if they're affecting you. Another thing is that it's always possible for there to be configuration drift or management drift. If what's actually running in operations varies from the specification that you've defined for the images or that you think you've defined for the images you plan to put into production, you're going to be, want to be aware of that, and you're going to want to control and manage that drift. Now, a lot of these runtime environments, they may not stay the same for very long because we're talking about a system with the continuous aspect that allows you to push new functionality into production very frequently. So a lot of incremental changes may appear in the production environment, and that increases the probability for drift, uh, even though they may not appear for very long. Um, even though images can, you can cycle through images fairly quickly as these changes are deployed. But at the other end of the spectrum, you may find that you have a number of instances of functionality that stay up a long time, and that can increase their exposure as well. It increases the, uh, the possibility that they may have been exploited or probed, so you may want to actually consider reducing the amount of time that any particular instance stays in operation. So visibility into the uptime for these environments is something you probably want to keep an eye on as well, too. So what does this mean for security teams going forward? Well, for one thing, a lot more granular modularity in the environment, and that means a lot more dependence on automation and orchestration to define the production environment, and that means a lot more automation. But that means a lot, many more moving parts to the environment as well, too. Without using automation and orchestration in security to keep an eye on what you think you've deployed in operations and keeping the operational environment up to speed with where you want it to be in terms of security definition, you're going to have to get familiar with the tools of automation and orchestration because otherwise these environments can become very complex very quickly without them. Uh, I mentioned earlier that in terms of um, shifting the emphasis uh, of people from, you know, we still rely a great deal on the development of applications and individual human effort in developing applications. But as we begin to see a marketplace, if you will, a functionality that's more driven by microservices and really more API driven, we'll start to see this shift more towards application engineering, if you will, which means the weaving together of microservices and functionality into more composite applications. So that's something you want to keep an eye on as well as a security professional, which means it's going to be increasingly critical uh, for you to become familiar with the tools and processes in your organization, understanding security specifications for these environments, and knowing how they can apply, be applied via these tools, as well as identifying key points of control, as well as key points of vulnerability throughout tool chains and throughout processes. So to make this road ahead as smooth as possible for you, you're going to, first of all, want to build bridges with development and operations teams. You're going to want to be aware of how you can support agility and not be seen as a roadblock or slowing down progress towards achieving business objectives through security. 
you're going to want to make sure that your team increasingly has the skills needed to deal with these environments and access not only to the tool sets used, but the right tools for doing the job that you want to do. And with that, I'd like to turn our talk over to my friend Dave Meltzer of Tripwire to talk about things from his perspective as a technology CTO. Dave? Excellent. And uh, thanks, Scott, for that presentation. That was uh, still great material on what's happening uh, in the, the organizations that Tripwire works with as well today. For um, many of Tripwire's customers, the kind of challenges that they're dealing with have to do with the complexity and the scale and the increasing number of kinds of applications and cloud providers and tools that are being used as their companies go through this transformation. Um, from their traditional IT and development approaches to uh, a fully baked DevOps uh, methodology and collaborative approach. For, for many large organizations, the, the future for years to come is one of a hybrid enterprise. Uh, and when I say that, it's a combination of physical servers, virtualization, private cloud, and public cloud infrastructure that's going to make up the IT systems that as a security team, we're going to be responsible for monitoring and ultimately protecting. Uh, in my role at Tripwire, I have the opportunity to go visit a, a number of our large customers and talk to them about what's their cloud strategy, what is their approach to DevOps, what are they doing. Uh, and I, what I've found in general is, in many cases, the, the application developers you know, collaborated and partnered up with IT to build up a DevOps organization and to adopt these new tools and methodologies. And on the backside, one of the benefits that they felt that they were getting out of that was they could in some way circumvent the existing security processes that were in place in order to make sure that things were heavily secured and optimized from a security perspective and had proper monitoring for security requirements and compliance regulations before they made their way into production instances. And so this shift is something that many security teams felt like that we got a little bit behind on as the application developers started to develop these tools. And now I think security as a community as a whole is actually doing a really good job catching up to that and understanding how can we build security controls into the DevOps processes so that rather than lose some of the security process we had in place, we can actually make it much better than it ever had been before. Uh, and I really think because of the automation capabilities that comes out of adopting DevOps, that you're actually going to see a lot of improvement in overall security process as you can bake your security controls into the DevOps system. Uh, and as Scott talked about, there is this interconnection and interlinking between DevOps, containerization, which, you know, most prominently the use of Docker today, and the use of public cloud infrastructure services. Clearly, DevOps is not limited to the use of public cloud infrastructure, but there are very few application developers and IT teams that are adopting public cloud services without leveraging a DevOps approach in how they're going to roll out change, configure systems, and deal with those kind of production changes. First on the containerization side, let me talk about that a little bit. From a perspective, uh, and Scott talked a little bit about the different options that you have around uh, dealing with registries, but I think from a security perspective, we can think of the idea of containers and we can think of the life cycle of how containers come to exist in an organization and then get orchestrated out into a production environment where actually they're executing. And you want to be able to insert yourself into that process. Um, one of the things I think we've learned over the years in security is if the only thing we're able to do is monitor things once they're already in production, inevitably that is often too late to solve the problems, especially as attackers are using more automated tools to exploit systems and look for vulnerabilities and look for misconfigurations, and that is becoming particularly prevalent in public cloud infrastructure providers where if you do have a misconfiguration, people are constantly crawling through and trolling, looking for those kind of things on the internet. And if that's something that's a publicly available service, probably going to get exploited pretty quickly. So from a containerization perspective, you want to think about, well, when my developers are making the containers, how do I make sure that when they build them, they're using a tool like Jenkins probably, how do I make sure it's actually securely built as a container before it makes its way into something like a container registry that your DevOps tools will then pull the containers out of? So a good security practice is, 
don't let insecure containers into your registry to begin with, then if you've already assessed them and assured their security, they won't make their way out of the containers uh, from any issue. Um, you also want to think as you orchestrate, and uh, Scott talked about Kubernetes, how do we make sure that as we orchestrate things, we're only taking securely configured containers out of the registry and putting them into our production instances? And then the last piece that you want to consider is as they're actually running, uh, there might be drift, there might be change. How do we know that uh, some containers, especially long running containers, have some continuous monitoring for them? Because if you don't have tools from a security perspective that are aware of containers, that know how to assess, that know how to get inside those containers, you're going to be left with a situation where you might be monitoring the underlying operating system, but 90% of the actual execution of the applications are happening in containers, which you may not have any visibility around. And so you want to keep that in mind as you start to adopt these things. You know, from a DevOps perspective, the desire of DevOps is often to move fast. One of the mantras of it is often move fast and break things. Uh, and from a security perspective, we want to make sure that as people are trying to move quickly, that security can be an enabler of moving fast within an organization, not a detractor, not a roadblock or a bottleneck for the DevOps systems. Uh, and many traditional application teams would have a security team do a threat modeling or look at the attack vectors or do some sort of security review or assessment before I approve the first version to go out to production. Um, we need to really change that paradigm in security. So instead of doing manual timely assessments up front and then monitoring things once they get into production, the ideal state for us would be to insert ourselves into the DevOps process. So as each individual configuration change, as a developer makes a new build, it goes from code to Jenkins to Puppet or Chef, ultimately out to the production servers, whether they be living within your on-premise systems or in the cloud, you want to be able to make sure that you're doing those assessments and that you can assure only secure applications are ever making their way into the production environment. If you can do that, you can help to create a flow where we're assuring the security of the system, and at the same time, we're making it happen in the time of DevOps. Uh, and that's what people refer to as DevSecOps today. It's trying to find the right points in the DevOps lifecycle to insert security into it. Uh, and if we can do that effectively, that's going to overall reduce our, our risk that we're facing. Now, there's all different points in the site, DevOps cycle that you might look at putting security controls into. The first place people often start is at the code level, uh, you know, thinking about application security and are people, you know, protecting the code and writing code in a secure way. But as we, as Scott talked about building and orchestrating the entire infrastructure, it's not just the application code. There are configuration, you're pulling in third-party libraries, you are standing up and running applications and processes, you're using containers. So trying to find your way to insert into all of those different pieces uh, of the life cycle is going to be really important for making sure that you're actually effective for that. And there's all sorts of things you can do from looking at, you know, what are the scripts themselves say? So, you know, Puppet and Chef gives a very flexible language for how you can do different things. You want to make sure that you're actually protecting the orchestration tools themselves in an effective way. You can think many of these orchestration tools actually have root access to your production servers because those are the things that are making change. What if someone got admin access to the puppet systems that were rolling out the production change? That would be a serious risk. And then as the example Scott used of someone was leaving keys around in code, you want to make sure that your application teams are taking effective means and using the best practices to make sure that they're not inadvertently sharing resources, including keys or passwords, uh, or are using, you know, broad, you know, root privileges across entire, you know, swaths of architecture and infrastructure. So you want to get much more effective at, uh, at doing that and monitoring those things. Just to kind of finish up here um, you know, with uh, one minute on Tripwire. So from a Tripwire perspective, you know, we, We've been monitoring uh, production systems for many years, but over the last couple of years had gotten increasing interest from our customers in trying to understand how do I get my assessments for configuration, for vulnerability, for monitoring for change baked into the DevOps process. So over the last uh, year or so, we've released freely available modules for Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. Uh, we'll probably have a SALT one that will be the next one that we'll be coming out with. Uh, these are available on Puppet Forge and uh, as Chef Cookbooks, uh, and we've decided to make them 
uh, freely available for anyone who wants to integrate our systems into those tools. Uh, and the first step is often just making sure that you're orchestrating the use of security monitoring as part of those rollouts. But we're increasingly seeing our customers who are trying to take that shift left approach of inserting the assessment capability as part of the production rollout and with an ideal state of if it doesn't meet our configuration standards, if it has vulnerabilities on it, let's not let it get rolled out to production. Let's kick it back to the person who just built it at the point of impact and say, here's the issue you have. Here's some recommendations of what you could do to go address that and then go hit the button, make a new build. And if you fix the problem, then we'll let it roll out into production. Uh, ultimately, that would assure us at a point of we're not going to roll out known configuration issues or vulnerabilities into our production environment. And if we do that, then all we need to deal with in production is configuration drift or new vulnerabilities that might get published, things like that. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to now uh, finish uh, with one uh, concept that uh, I've actually been hearing people talk about quite a bit in the security world, and that is Spectre and Meltdown, and what is the implications for the use of tools, and what are the implications for the use of DevOps and cloud infrastructure? One of the challenges that we face as we use shared cloud services is we're breaking away from a point of physical isolation to a point now where we may be sharing physical resources with other companies, uh, other people on the internet, and potentially other organizations that we don't know anything about. Now, if we believe virtualization works and is effective, then the fact we don't have physical isolation isn't an issue. But increasingly, now we've seen some vulnerabilities out in the wild that says there are ways that physical isolation can be broken. And we were seeing attacks like this even back, you know, 10 years ago around virtualization technology, and now the virtualization technology has now migrated into the cloud. And so this is something that we need to be really aware of. Uh, and we need to be really cognizant of, is there some benefit to trying to get physical isolation at the cloud level? Or are these risks that we're willing to accept because the odds they're actually going to be exploited are probably exceedingly small? It turns out that probably most security risks are you know, known vulnerabilities, known misconfigurations, these kind of advanced sophisticated attacks are probably not the most likely thing you're going to fall into. Uh, but it is something that's worth thinking about as you uh, continue to assess how are you going to adopt cloud services and DevOps methodologies. So with that, uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. And uh, we have a few questions that have been queued up through the presentation. Let me go ahead and uh, address a couple of these to Scott, and then we will wrap up. Uh, Scott. What do you say to the development or ops organizations that says security isn't agile enough or security will only slow them down? Boy, that's a question that security pros have had to deal with in all kinds of arenas for a long time. Um, before I answer that, I want to highlight something that's relevant to the answer, actually, and that's that something you mentioned early in, earlier in the talk, Dave, is that a lot of the capabilities of DevOps environments have really kind of solves some of the really hard problems in security. You know, taking an asset inventory used to be a matter of hours, if not days, and you, by the time you accumulated your inventory, you kind of wondered how much, how accurate it really was, 60, 80%. But with a DevOps environment, you can do basically an API-based query or a tool-based query and pull back all your relevant information in a very short period of time. And, of course, we talked some length about the values of immutability. These were all done not for the sake of security, but to enhance the efficiency of the environment. So IT becomes more cost effective, uh, IT becomes more responsive in putting functionality out into production operations much more quickly and in response to business demands. Security is a beneficiary of that. So we want to capitalize on that and make sure that we are helping to sustain agility in these environments where uh, security obviously going to be a pretty significant issue. So that's something that we can capitalize on in, in taking the security message to development and operations teams. And one of them comes straight out of Deming, for that matter. And this whole idea of shifting left, and what that means is if you can deal with security earlier in the pipeline before the environment gets pushed out to production, the cost of having to deal with issues may be much less. I mean, the worst case scenario is you have an issue exposed in a production environment that causes the business itself real heartache because it either can't be remediated, isn't being remediated fast enough, 
or you're just not even aware it exists. And we've had a number of examples of that, some high-profile ones over the last year. Um, deal with those issues earlier in the life cycle. Find ways to make it easier for developers to understand and recognize security issues so that they can implement more secure code. Do this earlier in terms of defining the images that are built before they're pushed into production. And keep an eye on the production environment to catch things like drifts so you can deal with those, nip those in the bud to the extent that you can as early on as possible. These are values that will support agility while still solving a really important problem for the business. There are very few businesses that aren't concerned about their security exposures these days. You want to tie those two messages of agility and efficiency together by highlighting how you can move security farther left in these pipelines and make it more cost effective to implement while still keeping the business safe. Great, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, another question. Um, it, both uh, Scott and Dave talked about the idea of containerization and how interlinked it is to DevOps. Uh, do you see that everyone's going to be using containerization, um, or are you going to expect other kinds of approaches that uh, are going to be used in these production environments that, that doesn't include that? Um, yeah, that's an interesting trend overall. Um, our, the way we refer to that here at 451 is this notion of, of invisible infrastructure, if you will, or disappearing infrastructure. And what we mean by that is that virtualization introduced a level of abstraction, which you talked about quite a bit in talking about Spectre and Meltdown Day. And um, the idea that infrastructure itself becomes software means that your visibility into your that you even really care much about the underlying hardware environment has been diminished. Of course, we see issues like Spectre and Meltdown bringing that back to the fore, but still software being a way to deal with those issues. So this continued abstraction of the underlying environment keeps progressing. Uh, a virtual machine would abstract the physical environment. Containers abs further abstract the underlying environment by packaging functionality and, and really slicing and limiting the exposure of the underlying operating system itself. Now we have this idea coming to market of serverless technology, which is maybe a bit oversimplified. But in effect, what that means is a service provider is taking on all responsibilities for infrastructure, availability, performance, you know, its structure, its management, and to a large degree, its security. They're promising to take care of all of that for you. And all you need to be concerned about as an enterprise is developing and deploying the business logic. You put the application logic, you put the functional logic up, in a service environment, and you don't really care about the underlying infrastructure. Of course, that's not entirely true. You are going to be responsible, for example, for meeting compliance requirements in that environment. That, the fact that you outsource that is not going to relieve you of the responsibility for compliance in those cases. But the idea there is that we care less and less about the underlying infrastructure because it's further and further abstracted. So I've seen a lot of people say that, well, you know, serverless is not going to overtake containers ultimately. You've got to keep in mind that containers are still the functional way that, that microservices in these environments themselves can be delivered. So even if you're not managing it directly yourself, it still may be there as the underlying vehicle. So don't lose sight of the context that you're referring to when you're talking about which of these will prevail or will predominate in the future. I do think because of the modularity of DevOps environments and the fact that applications can be uh, architected through composite components exposed as microservices and integrated via API, that we're going to see a lot more orchestration at that level in the way that applications are put together. But you'll still need to be aware of the underlying technologies that make them possible in the first place as you elaborate your security strategy. So, yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Dave. Great. Uh, we got time for one more question. Um, here it is. Sharing of physical resources and containers in a, virtualization, in a virtual environment is part of the technology. Would Spectre meltdown vulnerabilities be more of an issue with containers or virtualization? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, and then, Scott, you can chime in as well. Um, you know, c containers, you can almost think of them as like micro virtualization technology. The idea that someone could break out of the container and gain access to the, under, the host operating system and affect other things outside of that isolated environment uh, is something I think we need to be thinking about. And certainly if, if I was an attacker uh, and put, my hat, uh, put a black hat on for a second and said, well, if I, if I get access to the container, what would I want to do? Um, just like any other kill chain, the first thing I'm going to want to do is try and break out of that and try and pivot to get access to other resources on the system. So to the extent that you can break isolation uh, and get to the kernel, 
um, getting down to the hypervisor kernel level would let you break through both the containerization level and then and then the virtualization level as well. So it, it does remain a concern for containers, um, even though that you know that we haven't seen a lot of container specific isolation vulnerabilities or attacks yet. It's still very new technology, and that same pattern of attack would still be applicable. Um, that's a great answer, Dave. Uh, from the technology point of view, from the uh, from a business or strategy point of view, as a security strategist, I think I would probably consider the fact that you know something like Spectre or Meltdown is maybe not. This might be you know, overblowing it a bit, but it's almost an existential sort of threat to uh, a hyperscale provider, a cloud service provider, because it threatens the very fabric of their environment. So you know, if you take the risk perspective. You have to understand that they're greatly behooved to deal with this issue. Of course, the trade-off is that a lot of the fixes in the case of Spectre and Meltdown in particular meant that, you know, processor efficiency, the efficiency of the underlying platform may have gone down because of the steps that need to be taken to continue to assure isolation. And so there is some unintended consequences of that. If you're being charged per cycle for your environment, that might come back to hit the end user ultimately, but in terms of dealing with the security issue, if it's that significant a threat to the provider, the provider is very likely to want to address that even before their customers do. But if they don't or you're not happy with their response or you need to know the details of their response, you've got to understand what's your lever for getting them to respond. And to the extent that you have little or no visibility or control of the underlying environment, it's going to be uh, your operating agreement with the provider. Are, is there enough leverage that you have in that agreement to give you some influence with the provider in basically trying to get them to respond to a security issue? So the more that infrastructure disappears, using the metaphor that I used earlier, the more that your leverage with your providers is going to depend on the agreement as opposed to your, your ability to deploy your own technology environment and run that yourself. Compliance has had a hand in making sure that there remains a lot of hybrid and a lot of on-premise still. So, you know, the cloud service providers haven't completely overtaken the market yet by a long shot. But these are issues that when it comes to, you know, managing risk with a provider in particular, you know, how important is it to the provider to deal with it? And are you satisfied with the, the results that you've seen? And what kind of leverage do you have to make them respond? Thanks, Scott. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Kate Carson for a wrap-up. Thanks, Dave. Well, great. Um, I would like to thank both of our speakers today, Scott Crawford of 451 Research. Thank you, Scott. Great information. And David Meltzer of Tripwire. Thank you, David. And also, thank you to our audience for joining us today. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you taking this hour out of your day. As I mentioned before, we'll be sending out the link to the on-demand version of this webcast, as well as the slide deck. Also, if you'd like to earn a CPE credit, please respond to that email, and we will send you a proof, proof of attendance document. So we hope that you'll join us for future webcasts and virtual events. Check out our event schedule at www.tripwire.com. Thanks, and have a great day.